I used to work for the Chico County Sheriff back in the mid-90s. Chico really is the middle of nowhere, the poorest place in the entire state of Arkansas. Back when I was a deputy, there was never more than about 10,000 people in the entire county. It was and still is the kind of place that people drive through without a second thought. But I think about Chico a whole lot. I think about it every day. Sometimes it's all I can think about, no matter how much booze I sink or how many pills I take. And back in the fall of 96, Chico started to become flooded with a kind of low-grade crystal methamphetamine that was called crank or biker meth. High-grade meth forms crystals, hence the name, but the low-quality stuff is just a powdery white substance that can burn up the user's throat because of the stuff it's cut with. We were finding that junk everywhere. It was decimating the poor folks out there. It was in the schools, in the bars, even in the churches. We arrested this one kid who'd been awake all weekend and had sat there twitching in the pews until the collection plate came around. Didn't even care that people saw him take the money either and was too messed up to even have any means of a getaway. Violent crime skyrocketed in the space of about four months. Things were getting out of control. We were picking up tweakers from all over that were making pilgrimages to Chico just to spend their money on the cheapest, dirtiest crystal we at the department had ever seen. I put cuffs on guys from Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, even as far away as Indiana. The county sheriff even got a call from the governor who demanded something be done about it all and, as you can imagine, all that fecal matter rolled straight downhill. But we had no idea where this stuff was coming from. Anyone we picked up for selling wouldn't talk about who they got it from, no matter what we threatened them with. They were like crystal commandos, and from my experience, that's just not like tweakers to cover for each other. They'll do anything to stay out of jail because it usually means a forced detox. But these dealers, they kept their mouths shut like they were full-blooded mafia, La Crystal Nostra or something. Like they were more scared of the guys selling it to them than they were of us. We bagged one guy with six pounds of the stuff, and it was me that drove him over to the county for booking. Afterward, I went back to my car, and there was all this mud just caked onto the floor under the back seats of my cruiser. I mean, it was everywhere. It smelled real bad, and I was livid that he made such a freaking mess. But then it hit me. All that mud had to have come from somewhere, right? By the looks of it, we managed to bag the guy just as he'd gotten a re-up from his connection. So wherever this guy had just come from was muddy, real muddy, like maybe somewhere out near the Mississippi or one of the lakes out here in Chico. I decided to take a drive just to see what I could see, maybe a little walk too if the feeling took me. Besides, what's the worst that could happen? I found our crystal cooks and brought them in for the big win? Well, as it turns out, that actually was the worst thing that could happen, and afterwards, I'd never be the same again. I spent a lot of time fishing with my pa when I was a kid. That's pretty much all there was to do in Chico, a county of over 40 separate lakes and reservoirs, and I've been to almost all of them. Most of the shorelines are shale or sandy soil, but one particular shoreline is pure mud, one you're going to lose your shoes in if you don't have the foresight to wear rubber boots. And it has the infinitely creative but descriptive name of Mud Lake. And it was Mud Lake that I decided to take a drive to that afternoon. The lake itself isn't too popular with fishermen, not unless you're looking for some monster catfish, and those things can be much more trouble than they're worth to reel in. So as I'm tracing the edges of it on foot, I thought it was pretty strange to see a trail of smoke wafting up through some trees around the other side. I mean, it was faint real faint, and maybe if the wind had been blowing just a little, I'd have never seen it at all. But it was eerily still that day and just as quiet. It took me about 20 to 30 minutes of walking, but I traced the edge of the lake right around to the rough area I could see the smoke. The closer I got to the source, the more I began to smell this disgusting putrid stench, almost like a mix of rotten eggs and cat urine. I also noticed that patches of what would have otherwise been healthy plant life had started to die, like whatever I was closing in on was death itself, how no life could survive near it. I thought about turning back a few times, but 
eventually came across what I can only describe as a series of wood panel and corrugated iron shacks. I know I should have called out to see if anyone was home or announced myself as a deputy and demand that whoever was inside should come out, but the feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach just seemed to stop any words from coming out of my mouth. Cops don't go by the book all the time, especially not small town deputies like me. Besides, I couldn't hear anything coming from inside any of the shacks and aside from the small campfire burning in a clearing between the shacks, there were little signs of human inhabitancy. I pushed open the door to one of the shacks with my 44 drawn and immediately recoiled at the fumes that came out. I'd never actually seen a working meth lab before, but I didn't need any narcotics expert to tell me that's exactly what I'd just seen. There was all kinds of trash strewn around in there. Discarded packaging from cold medicine, batteries that had been cut open, used coffee filters, and that wasn't including all the improved glassware set up on a small table. That, and I had heard stories about how bad they'd smell from all the chemicals being mixed up in them, which must have been where that cat pee smell was coming from. I backed off from the shack, coughing and spluttering, feeling nauseous with my eyes streaming. I felt awful, but at the same time kind of elated. I was almost certain that I had found our meth cook. It was only when I searched the other shacks that I began to feel really freaked out. The first one was evidently some kind of sleeping area, the two camping cots set up on either side of the shack. Only the thing was, they didn't look used at all. They were covered in the same kind of trash that was strewn about the lab shack, gas canisters, tubs of what looked like raw chemical ingredients. Whether used, those shacks obviously didn't sleep much, if at all. There were also rolls of dollar bills all over the place. These guys weren't taking care of their profits at all, it seemed. Either they were making too much money to account for it all, or money just didn't matter to them, and that was a terrifying prospect to me. Whoever was flooding Chico with crank wasn't doing it for the cash. They were doing it for some other reason entirely. But it was the things that were written on the wood wall panels that really got my attention. All kinds of weird phrases and symbols have been scrawled on the walls in what appeared to be black marker pen, stuff in chicken scratch, handwriting so bad I could barely make any of the words out that were interspersed with skulls, devil looking things, and little black stars. I backed out of the second shack and went to check on the third, which was by far the worst one of all. There was another rotten smell coming from behind a flimsy wooden door, but this one was from something very different to a meth lab, and when I peeked inside, I almost puked from how bad it was. Surrounded by yet more piles of trash and money was a big old wooden stake that looked like it had been driven into the ground as deep as it could possibly go, and tied to that wooden stake was the most mutilated dead body I'd ever seen in all my years of police work. Whoever it was had been dead for a while, but they hadn't completely decomposed yet, and there were so many flying insects and maggots crawling all over their face and body that at first it kind of looked like they were moving. I'm not sure how much damage had been inflicted while they were still alive, and I pray that most of the mutilation had been done post-mortem, but the look of agony of the corpse's face makes that almost impossible to imagine. The poor soul that had been tied to that stake had been scalped, had one of their eyes removed, had teeth pulled, fingers cut off with the stumps looking like they'd been cauterized to stop them from bleeding too much. There were deep, dark-looking patterns of cuts across their face that suggested that they'd been carved up in a kind of ritualistic way while they were still alive. The same kind of black burn marks on their finger stumps were present on the torso and thighs too, looking almost like cigarette burns, but like they'd been inflicted by something bigger. There were many other wounds on the body that would have required a coroner to really be able to tell how they were inflicted, but one thing was clear to me. Whoever this was had been tortured, maybe even to death. Then right as I'm about to turn around to head back to my cruiser and radio the whole thing in, I hear something moving through the trees behind me. I spin around to see the filthiest backwoods monster I had ever seen, just walking through the trees in nothing but boots, a pair of urine-stained white briefs, a shin holster with what looked like a hunting knife tucked into it, and a gas mask. 
He had some kind of AR variant slung over his shoulder too, but luckily I had my 44 trained on him before he could react and reach for it. I told him not to move or I'd put him down, and at first, he starts raising his hands nice and slow. All I could see of his face was the cold, dead gaze that stared back at me through the misty, clear plastic eye holes of his gas mask. There was just nothing behind them, like they were a doll's eyes or something, alive but not alive. Then I heard something moving behind me and I figured it might have been his partner or whoever the second camping cot belonged to, and for just a second, I was dumb enough to give this guy my back out of fear that his partner was trying to sneak up on me, but it must have been a possum or something running through the woods because there was nothing there when I turned, and by the time I looked back, the guy in the gas mask was unshouldering his rifle and prepping the fire. I let off three shots at him, and I'm pretty sure I missed every one. In return, he let off an automatic burst of his rifle that ripped up the shacks behind me and somehow either from the poor vision of his mask or the recoil of the rifle, managed to miss me too. Next thing I know, I'm running through the trees, trying to use the trunks for cover in between looking for a solid position to return fire. I can hear this guy barking like a rabid dog while he's chasing me, and I fire three more shots in a running gun battle that leaves my 44 empty. He replies with another burst of his rifle, and although it didn't feel like I'd been hit right away, I suddenly found I wasn't able to run anymore, like I suddenly lost all feeling in my right shin. I hear him make this muted whooping sound like he must have seen me go down and realized one of his shots had hit the mark, but from the lack of follow-up fire I figured that he too must have been out of ammo. I didn't see any spare magazines on him, and he was half naked after all, but he did have that knife on him, and I could hear him hollering about how he was going to use it on me as he took off after me through the trees. The whole time I'm reloading my 44. i I'm thinking about the state of the body back there in the third shack, how no one but me knew I was out there, and how he'd have all the time in the world to work me over, just as I'm assuming he'd done to that poor soul that was tied to the stake. That was the most afraid I'd ever been in my entire life. Every single other emotion pales in comparison to the intensity of that fear. I was shaking so bad I could barely load my revolver. Even with the speed loader, I could barely manage it. But somehow I did, rolling onto my back and aiming just in time to see this monster coming through the trees at me with his knife in hand. I put all six bullets into him, and then watched him collapse into the dirt like a sack full of rocks. It wasn't over though. I still had to crawl back through the mud and the blood to my cruiser, and I had to snake past the cook's dead body in order to do so. The whole time I'm crawling past him, I was expecting his eyes to just open suddenly like a horror movie or something, for him to roll onto my back and plunge that hunting knife into my neck while I was trying to crawl away. Every second was drawn out, my heart racing as I tried to keep one eye on the guy and one eye ahead of me, but he didn't wake up. No one just gets up after taking six forty-four slugs to the chest. I was retired on medical grounds not long after. Doctors said the bullet that hit me fractured when it hit the shin bone, and there's been a piece of lead still stuck in my right leg ever since, meaning I now walk with a permanent limp. But that's just the physical scarring of what I went through that day. Sometimes I think the mental after effects have been far worse I barely slept a wink for months, and if I actually did manage to drift off after drinking myself into a stupor, the nightmares would be enough to have me waking up screaming, having soaked the bed sheets with cold sweat. It got so bad that my wife couldn't sleep in the same bed as me until hours upon hours of therapy sessions gave me some small measure of closure. I thought for a while she might divorce me, because the man that came back from Mud Lake just wasn't the same as the one that drove out there. I'm doing much better now. Me and the wife are still together and we live down in Florida, quite comfortably too, thanks to the compensation I got from the government. I got a Medal of Valor from them too, something most guys would keep on display somewhere, but I keep that thing locked away in a drawer. I figured maybe if I write something like this, it might help process what happened back at Mud Lake, thinking that it might help me get past it. 
My therapist thought it might not be a good idea, and I told him I'd rather just forget, but I know that's not possible, that the memories of Mud Lake will stay with me until I'm as dead as that cook and his gas mask. So back in October of 2018, a little game came out on the Xbox and PlayStation that would become an overnight sensation and take over the lives of gamers everywhere for a long, long time. Seriously, people must have wondered why Howdy seemed to have replaced High in many people's vocabularies, why all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of people were too sick to go to work on the Monday that followed, and when they finally did show up for work, they made cryptic references of how all they wanted to do was to get back to Horseshoe Overlook. For those that haven't figured it out already, the game I'm talking about is Red Dead Redemption 2, and those that work their way through it will understand the obsession with it. But for me, it went way beyond turning Halloween into an excuse to dress up like a cowboy, because I wanted to try all that stuff for real. I'm not talking about robbing trains, hunting crocodiles, and shooting lawmen, of course. I'm talking about taking to the open range on horseback and seeing parts of this country that city folk like me rarely see. And that's how I ended up in Glasgow. Now, a lot of you are going to hear that and be like, how did Red Dead take you all the way to Scotland? But there are two Glasgows. Well, maybe even more than two, but the one I'm talking about is way out in Montana. And when I say way out in Montana, I mean it well and truly is the middle of nowhere, and it took us like two days' ride to get there from the point we set off from. It's like a little oasis of civilization and a mind-numbing expanse of sheer wilderness. Or, at least, I thought it was civilized. Because no offense to anyone from Glasgow or that area of Montana in general, but there are some seriously crazy barbaric people around these parts, and I was unlucky enough to run into one. So like I said, we just done two days worth of hard riding through some pretty wild country to get to Glasgow, and I didn't know the meaning of the word saddle sore until then. The whole idea was that we get two days rest and relaxation in the small town of around 2000 and we get back on the trails. And let me tell you, after those two days, I understood why cowboys drank so heavily. It probably wasn't even to dull the loneliness or to shoo away the ghosts of those they shot down. It was probably just for the pain-killing effect from being so saddle sore. Seriously, being saddle sore feels like Iron Mike went to town on your groin and not in a good way. Anyway, so me and a few people in the same trail tour group as me find this little place called Abbey's Palace on 1st Avenue South, and we get to drinking. Real hard, too. I'm not even going to say that I wasn't a jerk. I probably talked way too loud and said some kind of derogatory things about small towns like Glasgow. Not that I meant to be an a-hole or anything like that, I just feel like I kind of understand why someone might take issue with what I was saying and how I was dressed, because someone certainly did. So from what I can remember, and honestly, that's not very much, this guy saunters up to me and asks me what my problem is. Now, I do remember exactly what I said at the time, because the dudes in my group didn't stop reminding me of it for days after. I put on my best John Wayne voice and was all like, my problem's with you, pilgrim. Before slapping the guy's arm as if to say, aren't I the funniest? Only he doesn't find it funny at all. That area of Montana wasn't some little novelty to him like it was to me. To him, it was his whole life. So my big dumb drunk brain doesn't quite realize that there's some conflict going down until it's too late, but by that point, I've made this guy so mad and so much that... He legit wants to knock my teeth out. All I did was apologize, try to reassure everyone that I just am tired and drunk and ignorant, but the entire bar is looking at me, with my trail buddies not being too happy either. So needless to say, we got asked to leave. And that was the point that I realized I was a lot more of a Micah than an Arthur last night, and the next morning I was seriously ashamed of myself and I was actually kind of glad to be leaving Glasgow behind. But I'm not sure I deserve what came the next morning, and I'm 100% sure my trail buddies didn't deserve it either. 
because a good few hours after a dawn departure, we're on the trails heading west again when I heard what sounded like a firecracker going off a few feet above my head. I was seriously exhausted and hungover, so when it happened the first time, I wasn't exactly sure what I was hearing, only that the horses really didn't like it. They're making those high-pitched, whiny sounds, and our trail guide starts freaking out and telling us to turn back and keep our heads down. It was only then that I realized what was happening. We were getting shot at. Now, I'd never been shot at before, so I had no idea that when a bullet passes near enough to you, it makes a kind of loud snapping sound. That's the sound of the bullet breaking the sound barrier as it passes by, like a mini version of the sonic boom that those old Concord planes used to make. We ended up galloping back the way we came, crying out in fear and hearing yet more of those cracks and the occasional whiz, which means the bullet is even closer than when it cracks, as we're getting out of there. We ended up riding all the way back into Glasgow, which was about 15 miles back eastward, to report that someone had actually fired on us as we were traveling along the trails. We actually booked ourselves back into the motel that we had stayed in the previous two nights, had to cough up a bunch of money to pay for the horses to be looked after, which, to be honest, was the least of our worries since someone had literally just tried to kill us. Or at least, I thought they tried to kill us. A few of us ended up going back to Ali's palace to try to kill two birds with one stone. It would give me a chance to apologize for last night's bad behavior, whilst also giving us a place to drink away the jitters of almost taking a bullet. And funnily enough, guess who's there? The guy I ended up angering the previous night. And just as I'm gearing up to apologize to him and everyone else who was present, I catch him kind of grinning at me. Again... Maybe it was my dumb, hungover brain, but I didn't quite get the significance of it, not right away. And then it hit me. I sidled up to him with me being the angry one this time and hissed something like, You tried to shoot us, didn't you? Only the sentence was laced with considerably more curse words. He just grinned back at me and says something like, Boy, I didn't try and shoot you. Which at first calmed me down a little, but then he says, if I tried to shoot you, I'd hit you, and you wouldn't be standing here right now. His words sent a chill through me, and then goes on to say something along the lines of, And you just try and kick up a stink about it. We're thick as thieves in this town. You can throw any accusation you like at me, not a single one will stick. And that was the most scared I'd been in a long time. Not quite as scary as getting shot at, but scary for a whole other reason. And not long after, for the second time, I was glad to be getting out of Glasgow. There really is no better way to describe Monroe County, West Virginia than the middle of nowhere. One of the state's most southerly counties, Monroe, is perhaps the most overwhelmingly rural place in the entire eastern United States. There is not a single stoplight or fast food outlet anywhere in the whole county, and has one of the lowest population densities of any county in the whole nation. Much like any rural area of the eastern U.S., Monroe has its fair share of problems with opiate addiction and the crimes associated with it. But a disappearance or a murder is a rare event indeed, and when one actually occurs, it stirs up rather a lot of attention from citizens and law enforcement alike. So in April of 2007, when a dark red Chevy pickup truck was found abandoned behind a derelict building in Peterstown, it sent ripples of fear through the small community in which it was discovered, and it's because the truck belonged to a man named Timothy Wayne Dalton. And by that point, Timothy had been missing for almost three weeks. Well, according to his missing person's profile, Timothy was just over 200 pounds and had dark brown hair and pale blue eyes. He was last seen wearing a dark blue button-up shirt, light gray shorts, and black Nike sneakers. There's a good chance that he was also wearing a dog tag necklace, a relic of a relative's military service, and was also carrying a pocket knife. Close friends stated that he sometimes went unshaven for maybe a week at a time, and he was never known to sport any kind of lengthy facial hair, and was known to talk with a subtle stutter. 
In the brief period before the truck was found, local sheriff's deputies had managed to build up a picture of the events that had preceded Timothy's disappearance. He had paid a visit to his mother on March 26th and apparently behaved perfectly regularly for the most part. They made small talk about his firewood cutting job, which, as lowly as it seemed, made Timothy's mother very proud that his son was gainfully employed, especially when the economy was tanking in such a dreadful way. But at certain points, Timothy's mother noticed that he was acting rather skittishly, peering out of her trailer window every so often as if watching for something or someone. It's not entirely unusual for a boy to act in a protective manner over his beloved mother, so she didn't think too much of his watchful behavior. Yet this was the last time her son was ever seen alive, with the only clue to his potential whereabouts being the abandoned truck that was found two and a half weeks later. Despite his mother's concerns, local law enforcement insisted that there was no foul play involved in his disappearance. Yet there are solid reports from reputable sources that when the truck was discovered, the window on the driver's side of the vehicle was found to be broken, with glass lying on the interior, indicating it had been smashed from the outside. Despite this, police declared that there was no clear indication that there had been any kind of struggle, speculating that the window might well have been broken before or after he had disappeared. Speaking to Timothy's family members, police heard how they would be very out of character for Timothy to just vanish without at least informing them that he was going somewhere. And while it was a well-known fact that Timothy had dabbled in some non-violent crime in his past, he has no outstanding warrants and was not a suspect of any recent burglary case. He's been described by many as a timid fellow with a heart of gold, and as far as his friends know, he was not involved in the narcotics trade, either as a dealer or a user. This essentially eliminated the possibility that he had skipped town out of fear of being arrested for something, a theory that was compounded by the fact that pretty much all of his meager belongings could still be found at his place of residence. As it stands, there are two prevailing theories that attempt to explain Timothy's disappearance. The first is that, for whatever reason, he owed money to a one percenter motorcycle gang that sometimes passed through the area. This theory came about due to the fact that at the time he vanished, Timothy's sister was dating a Hell's Angel who was patched to a Princeton chapter of the gang, a town just a half hour away from Peterstown. As a frequent drug user, she was careless with her finances and it's very possible that the angels passed along whatever debt she owed to her blood relatives. Then, when Timothy couldn't pay up, the angels decided to make an example out of him. The second theory revolves around a rumor that Timothy had bad blood with a local deputy who was supposedly violent, unstable, and corrupt. It was common knowledge among members of the Peterstown community that one particular area police officer believed that he was above the law. The same officer happened to give Timothy a ticket during a traffic stop one day, one that Timothy insisted was unfairly cited. He swore he'd see the cop in court, then to the surprise of the local townsfolk, he did and ended up actually winning the case. He was awarded a sizable compensation. The cop in question was disciplined for his apparent misconduct. It was a humiliation, one the officer couldn't ever get over and as much as this particular cop was an embarrassment to the forest, there's every chance that a bunch of good old boy deputies would close ranks around him should he have to decide to take a little revenge. This would most definitely explain how the reports of a broken window suddenly morphed into a conclusion of a no signs of a struggle. Yet these two theories, as elaborate as they seem, are still little more than conjecture. So the question remains, what could have happened to Timothy Dalton? It certainly wouldn't have been easy for him to leave Monroe County without his truck, as it truly is in the middle of nowhere with no local taxi companies in the area or bus routes running through it. The only explanation is that someone picked him up, conscious or unconscious, dead or alive, and took him out of Moreau. Peterstown has a population of just less than 700. People talk, people see things, but apparently nobody saw hide nor hair of Timothy after he visited his mother's place. The woods around the town might be dark and deep, but they're actually kind of commonly frequented by local hunters who often scour the backwoods for fresh meat to put on the table to save a few dollars from the grocery bill. Surely, if Timothy was murdered and dumped in the woods, 
A hunter, or perhaps a hunting dog, would have come across his remains at some point. As far as we can tell, it really is as if the guy just disappeared, dropped off the face of the earth one day from some unknown reason. But maybe it's the case that whoever did disappear, Timothy, knew a little too much about the process of searching and finding someone. Maybe it was a person who'd had experiences in finding bodies, who for professional reasons would know the most effective method of making someone just up and vanish without leaving so much as a trace of them behind. But whoever that might be is still completely up for debate. Yet perhaps it might be better if we avoid any kind of heavy speculation, lest we offend the wrong person, a person who might just be violent, unstable, and corrupt. Electric Forest is an electronic music festival that normally takes place at the end of June in Rothbury, Michigan. Nestled in the very depths of Sherwood Forest, the festival truly is in the middle of nowhere and incorporates all the natural beauty of the towering woodland trees into the experience of those who choose to attend. By day, fans can roam around the enchanting scenery, hanging out among the pop-up installations or the hundreds of hammocks that hang between the tree trunks, but once the sun sets, they can watch as the forest is lit up by the many light fixtures, and according to many, that's when the magic really begins. The exhilarating atmosphere combined with jaw-dropping light displays and spontaneous secret parties all match with a carefully curated lineup, generates a truly unique experience for one and all. It's this particular music festival that 29-year-old Kevin Graves wished to attend during the summer of 2018. Hailing from Oakland County, Michigan, Kevin bought tickets for himself and his girlfriend who was instantly sold on the idea of partying in such a unique and unusual place. Both were fans of electronic dance music, but had found themselves tiring of visiting the same old clubs week in and week out, so Electric Force provided the perfect way to switch things up a little. But after only a day or two of partying among the trees, the blissful feeling between himself and his girlfriend apparently turned sour, and the pair began to argue intensely. Speculation as to the reasons behind these arguments ranges from the couple having run out of money, to overcompensation of alcohol, to Kevin having witnessed his girlfriend flirting with other guys. All of the above is up for debate, but what we know for certain is that after a particularly vicious confrontation, Kevin walked out of the main festival grounds to return to their campsite alone. Fellow festival goers had reported seeing a man leaving the site who was very upset, possibly even in tears. It's a rather sad end to a tumultuous relationship, but what makes this incident particularly terrifying is that after these sightings, Kevin was never seen again. His girlfriend returned to the campsite several hours later expecting to find Kevin sleeping off the effects of the drugs and alcohol he had ingested. But when she unzipped the front flap of the tent and peered inside, she found it completely empty. This wasn't exactly a surprise to her though, and she figured either Kevin had gotten lost on his way back, possibly even found another group of revelers to hang out with to cheer himself up, or that he had headed back towards the main festival compound to either look for her or party some more. So with that in mind, she simply crawled into her sleeping bag and got some much-needed rest. The following morning, Kevin still hadn't returned, but again, his girlfriend wasn't particularly alarmed. It was only when the festival came to an end that she had to find her own way home that she actually began to worry. Kevin hadn't seemed to have returned to his apartment either, and to his girlfriend's knowledge, he was still in Sherwood Forest. It was around then that she broke and contacted his close family regarding his apparent disappearance, who in turn contacted the police to report Kevin missing. Law enforcement set about scouring the area surrounding the festival site using every asset at their disposal, using sniffer dogs, aerial units, and dive teams. Not a trace of Kevin could be found anywhere. They then appealed to the public for information regarding Kevin's whereabouts and Many people called into the missing person's hotline claiming to have spotted him in the days after the festival. Callers stated that they had seen him around other cities in Michigan, as well as in other surrounding states. In some cases, 
Kevin was spotted at a motel not far from the festival site, and others at a diner in the same sort of area. There were also suggestions that Kevin had ran off to join some kind of religious cult that was in attendance at the festival, given that their colorfully branded bus was said to be present at the event. After some investigation, the group was found to be the Word of God, an ecumenical, charismatic missionary Christian community founded in the late 60s that is based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But a spokesman for the Word of God denies ever being at Electric Forest that weekend, and Kevin's family insists that it's pretty much out of the question that he would run off somewhere without at least telling them first. The behavior of Kevin's then-girlfriend has also raised a great deal of suspicion among those that investigated his disappearance. In the immediate aftermath, she posted a few grief-stricken posts on Facebook, the kind you might expect to read if Kevin had been confirmed deceased. Yet nobody was ever found, and as far as police knew, he wasn't dead at all, just missing. And then instead of cooperating and staying in touch with Kevin's family as one might expect her to, she proceeded to block most of them before refusing to answer any more questions with regards to what happened that weekend or where he might have ran away to. According to her, their relationship was on the rocks at the time. She also apparently posted on a Reddit comment after his disappearance that claims he was suffering from mental illness and that he had a history of threatening to end his own life when they had previously come close to breaking up. There is every chance that she simply wishes to move on from a painful period of her life away from drug and alcohol use, and away from the pain of knowing that she might have contributed to a tragic and unforeseen event. However, there is also a chance that she is so uncooperative because she knows way more than she is comfortable sharing. Police managed to interview a handful of the festival's staff that were working during the same weekend that Kevin went missing. Although most couldn't remember seeing Kevin specifically during their time there, as the event is attended by hundreds if not thousands of festival goers, some told stories of revelers going missing year in and year out. One even told police a story of how one person went missing after partying too hard and was found as far away as Alabama. Yet another admitted that it wasn't exactly a rarity for people to die at the festival due to excessive alcohol or narcotics use, often people who mix things that really shouldn't go together. He then told police of a rumor he'd heard from a few different attendees of a guy who had actually died sitting up. Others had just assumed that he was asleep and continued to drink and dance around an actual dead body, becoming extremely distressed when they realized he was dead and not just passed out. Other members of staff admitted that sometimes they weren't sure if the location of the festival was a safe choice, that they worried that some might be messed up and would wander off among the trees wearing very little clothing, only to be subjected to some stormy weather that might cause them to pass away as a result of exposure. There was one member of the festival staff who told the police a story that they were initially convinced was Kevin. A man who seemed to be very upset by something was going around the main compound giving away all of his possessions, including expensive electronic items and large amounts of cash. These are in line with reports from Kevin's family that he'd apparently emptied his bank account in the week before the festival was due to start. So what actually happened to Kevin at that festival? Was it the case that he simply was so grief-stricken by the breakup with his girlfriend that he had opted to simply up and vanish from Michigan? Perhaps this grief was something that a religious cult could prey upon to induct him into the ranks. Or perhaps such a cult would be able to use the heavy amount of drugs in his system to essentially brainwash him into the way of thinking. Regardless of what happened, we can all agree it's an extremely scary prospect that we could end up basically vanishing from the face of the earth after attending something as seemingly benign as a simple music festival. Perhaps we're never truly safe, no matter where we are, or what we're doing. Driving through the thick woodland in the middle of nowhere near Highlandville, Missouri, you might just happen to see a rather bizarre looking sight nestled in the hills of the Ozarks. At first, you might think you're hallucinating, having seen something so peculiar peeking up through the treetops. The structure that might greet you looks far more like it belongs in the French Alps than rural Missouri, a huge medieval looking castle style structure that looks like something out of a fairy tale. 
but you wouldn't be hallucinating at all, because the building I'm describing is very real indeed, the mysterious Chateau Pensmore, also known simply by the mononym Pensmore, is one of the largest most grandiose houses in the entirety of the United States, with its construction and purpose being shrouded in intrigue, enigma, and myth. But the real reason behind all the secrecy might not be that the owner is simply a very private and paranoid person. It could be because the truth is far too terrifying for the general public to comprehend. The Pensmore Mansion construction began way back in the year 2008, when a former Central Intelligence Agency spook turned businessman began to have blueprints drawn up for the ultimate country retreat. It would be something of an understatement to say that Stephen T. Huff was being overly ambitious when he dreamt up the idea of a 72,000 square foot home, but the former astrophysicist and founder of Sensor Systems was more than prepared to see the endeavor through, and was most definitely in possession of the resources and the patience to do so. But what makes pens more truly unique is not only the design, but also the choice of materials used for its construction. Pensmore was built with a state-of-the-art insulated concrete structure, its 12-inch thick walls reinforced with a novel form of high tensile steel fiber known as helix. This advanced combination of stone and metal is apparently dense and durable enough to survive almost anything man, machine, or mother nature can throw at it. Explosives, raging infernos, earthquakes, hurricanes, nothing could so much as put a dent in Chateau Pensmore exactly as Stephen Huff had designed it. The structure is bulletproof, blastproof, fireproof, insectproof, ageproof, more or less indestructible. This house will be standing 2,000 years from now. Even then, it will be hard to knock down. Huff once said when being interviewed by a national publication that focuses on rare and unique real estate, and it's a matter of public record that he took the time to put his dream home to the test. It would take eight long years before Pensmore was finally declared fit for human habitation. At one point, a huge portion of the structure fell into a sinkhole that opened up on the grounds of the estate, but Huff slogged on with the work at hand, and the finished product is an objectively extraordinary one. When it was finally finished in late 2016, Pensmore stood at an imposing five stories tall, boasting five separate living quarters complete with 14 bathrooms, 13 bedrooms, a music room, observatory, grand ballroom, movie theaters, and a huge host of other recreational and professional spaces, one of which is known to be a kind of museum which Huff himself curates. Pensmore also has over 4,000 cutting-edge solar panels, 9 tons of batteries in varying sizes, and the entire property is host to herds of wild Osaba Island pigs, a hardy breed of swine that are kept as a kind of self-sustaining food source. Stephen Huff poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the property, sparing no expense in creating a truly self-sustaining, energy-efficient fortress of a home in one of the most remote and isolated areas of the country, perhaps even the world. But there remains a question that could transfix all who ponder it, and that is, what exactly would possess an ex-U.S. Army intelligence officer and CIA agent to build such a structure? Publicly, Stephen Huff has told those that pose the question that Pensmore Mansion is a kind of experiment, an experiment intended to demonstrate viability and practicality of creating a truly energy-efficient, self-sustaining structure that can be safe and secure as well as environmentally friendly. The purpose of his design is not simply as a domicile either. The basic blueprint can be used as a school, a hospital, or any number of purpose-built facility that needs to remain standing in a disaster-prone area of the country. Huff has also explained that Pensmore is essentially a tangible exhibition which showcases not only the durability of the materials involved, but also the architectural feats his company is capable of, making Pensmore construction a kind of giant advertisement for sensor systems. But why the Ozarks? Why not Alaska or Nevada or Montana? Why pick rural Missouri over all the other isolated or remote areas of the country? Huff explained that the particular area of the Ozarks in which Pensmore is built is subject to some of the least constrictive regulations in the country, with the local government taking somewhat of a laissez-faire approach to social intervention. 
Missouri is also an area of the U.S. that would present Pensmore with all manner of environmental challenges, such as extremes of hot and cold, tornadoes, storms, everything Huff would need to prove that his brainchild could withstand even the harshest of weather. But if this was the case, if the whole thing was simply intended as proof of concept, why not build something smaller? Why not simply test out the materials on a smaller, more controlled, and less costly scale? All of Huff's responses seem to suggest that he isn't exactly being completely open or honest concerning his motivations, with his answers only succeeding in raising yet more questions. When construction of the Pensmore Mansion began, rumors spread like wildfire among the local population, rumors that grew only more bizarre and outlandish as time went on. One of the most popular theories among the more conspiratorially minded native Missourians is that Pensmore is a base of operations for the New World Order, a place where their shadow government will congregate during the final days of human civilization, potentially as a result of a catastrophe they themselves are planning. There are some who even suggest that Pensmore is some kind of government facility, one hiding in plain sight that may be home to a covert black ops installation that houses anything from alien technology or highly advanced weather control weaponry to wormhole generating equipment or bio-warfare labs. Such cutting-edge technology is said to be secreted away in a vast network of underground tunnels that have been constructed in the supposed sinkhole that opened up or was excavated during the mansion's construction. Some of the locals have also claimed to have heard an extremely loud sound coming from Pensmore's vicinity at nighttime, something akin to a train rumbling through the area, despite the fact that there are no train tracks running through that area. Others insist that they have seen unmarked black 4x4s rolling in convoys towards the compound that houses the building, ominous looking helicopters, or mysterious armed guards that aggressively shoo away those who try to get too close. One man told a local news agency that he tried to fly his civilian bot camera equipped a drone over the compound in the hopes of a little innocent observation, only to find the thing's electricals shorted out before falling from the sky like a dead bird. And so we must ask ourselves, what exactly is Pensmore Mansion's real purpose? If it were just the case that it was the opulent home of some eccentric but ultimately paranoid billionaire, we could understand it being constructed in the way that it is. But Stephen T. Huff is much more than just some skittish germaphobe. He's a military intelligence officer and a CIA astrophysicist. He's a man who knows things, whose entire career for the span of many, many years was based around knowing things, sometimes very secretive things that are hideously unfit for public consumption. So what does Stephen Huff know that we don't? What had he learned in his years in various intelligence agencies that made him want to accumulate the wealth to build a veritable fortress in the middle of nowhere? Let's just pray we don't ever have to find out. Let's pray we never have to suffer the repercussions of whatever forbidden knowledge that Stephen is in possession of. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on spreadshirt.com. And check out the let's read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts, all links down below. Thanks so much, friends, and I love all of you so much.